you'll love this story. So I get there. So the guy gets up and he says, um, I'm going to tell you things that Wall Street doesn't want you to know. I think to myself, gee, I wonder if somebody from Wall Street wants to attend this session because they would learn what they didn't want us to know. So he spends an hour and 45 minutes. Now he's really good. But what really impressed me was the guy that did the pitch. The pitcher, and I'm in the pitch business. I tell stories and this guy was really great. So I decide after the fact, I'm gonna find him. Welcome back to the Wits Podcast. Once again, we have an awesome, wicked guest today. We have Neil Centurio, who is a classic serial entrepreneur. He's had three careers, and the joke is he's unable to hold a job, but he started out writing sitcoms in Hollywood. He moved into real estate development and finally into technology. He started nine companies as CEO or chairman, and he's invested in another half a dozen. Currently, Neil is the CEO of Blackbird Ventures, which is a small venture fund that is focused on very early stage companies. Neil has been teaching entrepreneurship for a very long time and along with his coaching currently he's taught at san diego state university in the mba program university of california and he is currently teaching entrepreneurship at the donovan state prison he has also authored books one of them being i'm there for you baby which is an entrepreneur's guide to the galaxy today we're going to talk about storytelling we're going to talk about partnerships and he's going to share a little bit about what it takes to give back in the world and be successful neil i am super excited to talk to you today welcome to the show Thank you, Greg. What do you want to talk about today? Well, in honor of the election, I'm going to tell a story. I, I've, got, I've got a few stories and we run out of time. Fine. So here's a story. You may remember it's about 2013, mm -hmm. 13 or 14. And there's something called Trump University. Yeah, I remember this. It has promoted this thing called Trump University. And I'm fascinated. I, uh, I get an email that says, would you like to attend Trump University? And uh, I write back and I say yes. And so the session, the session is held at the Town and Country Hotel. <clears throat> There's four sessions, eight to 10, 10 to 12, and then one to three and three to five. And the first one is on the stock market. And there's one on estate and one on real estate, but I'm gonna go. Now, at this point in time, I'm the CEO of a startup, but, but I'm, I have a real business. And so to some extent, I'm, and, and I've certainly made some money over the time, so I'm going to go and, and uh, <clears throat> see what happens. I am astounded. You'll love this story. So I get there. There are 400 people in this, in this uh, conference room, in this uh, you know, ballroom at the Town and Country Hotel. Wow. So I take a seat towards the back. I tend to sit at the back and, and uh, I look around. Now, this is a little bit stereotypical and maybe a little bit racist, but I don't know. Nobody else looks like me. I mean, maybe a few of them do, but not yeah, that I'm, many. I'm, so I'm thinking like to myself, you, like hey, you. why aren't you guys at a job? I'm the CEO of a company. I can sort of take an hour off. Why? What? Do, do you, there's no jobs? What? What are you doing? So there's 400 people who have come to pay. Now for, this part of it is free, okay? They're gonna listen to the Trump University. This is great. So the guy gets up and he says, um, I'm gonna tell you things that Wall Street doesn't want you to know. I think to myself, gee, I wonder if somebody from Wall Street wants to attend this session because they would learn what they didn't want us to know. I mean, you gotta just think about that. I'm gonna tell you stuff that Wall Street doesn't want you to know. Okay, I'll accept that. So he spends an hour and 45 minutes. Now, he's really good. I mean, I'm going to tell you how good he is later. And he points out, he spends the whole session to explain that when the red arrow goes down, you have to sell. And when the green arrow goes up, you buy. This is fabulous. Wall Street does not know anything about red arrows and green arrows. And these 400 people do. It's fantastic. Okay. It gets to quarter, it's, it's an hour and 40, at, at the hour and 45 minute mark, he says, okay, here's the deal. If you go to the first people who go to the back of the room and sign up, you get this, you get this, and you get this. And the total package, the starting package is like $800 and the total package is 3000 You may remember that one of the law firms in San Diego actually sued Trump University and won a settlement of $25 million, but that was after the fact. This is real time, 2013, 14. 
I'm, a, I'm sitting there, I, I was dazzled. Maybe 100 to 120 people of the 400 go to the back. Like, whoa. And they sign up and they get a book and they get this and they're starting to write checks and credit cards. And I'm amazed. But what really impressed me was the guy that did the pitch. The pitcher, and I'm in the pitch business. I tell stories. I, am a, I have a PhD in pitching. And this guy was really great. So I decide after the fact, I'm going to find him. So I call up the Trump University in New York. And I say, I'd like to talk to whatever, forget his name now, Bob Johnson. They said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? Said, We're not, we don't talk to you. But he was really good. I'd like to know. All right. Now, he was really good. He could spin a story. He was telling stories. And it was the little guy. And there's the man. And you guys are going to get empowered. He was fabulous. Now, I'm a pretty relentless character. So eventually, I find him. He's in Colorado. And I call him. I say, I attended that session. You are the best I've ever seen. Could I hire you? He says, no. I said, let me ask you a question. Are you in the stock market? He says, are you kidding me? I said, what do you mean? He says, I just give that pitch. I learned the script. I'm a really good pitcher. I'm actually on a ranch in Colorado. I work three, four days a month. Trump flies me around. Do you buy and sell stocks? No. So you don't know anything about the stock market, but you're telling people that when the red arrow goes down, you sell it and the green arrow goes up, you buy it. He says, yeah. I thought to myself, only in America. This guy is, and he talks as if he were in the stock business, had been Wall Street, worldwide, Goldman Sachs. And the answer is, he's an right. actor. I thought that was fantastic. But the dark sentence is, there were 120 people who were going to get conned. The idea that somehow, that, I mean, I love this part, which is, you always see TV ads, which is, we're going to tell you something the other guy doesn't want you to know. And I'm thinking, what, they don't have a television? They can't listen? They couldn't attend the right. session? That's my Trump University right. story. But you know what you just described was the snake oil sna salesperson, the person that sits on stage and they stage sell, right? And, you know, this is what I've battled against in the industry, which is everyone's got this great pitch and this great outline and this great promise and this great this and not many people. And that story just acknowledges that a lot of these, you, you got to be careful, man. Like, you know, if you're really going to go through the exercise of developing yourself as a leader, as a person, and you're going to be a better entrepreneur, a better business owner, you know, buyer beware. I think, you know, the question we've always got to ask ourselves is exactly that through that expert. Have they actually done it? So good for you for figuring out whether the, uh, the guy that was actually in the stock market. So, so I'm going to, now I'm going to put the twist on okay. the story. So I also teach, uh, as you know, I, I coach CEOs. I've, I've been a CEO seven or eight different times and, and it's important. Now, remember, what I saw in that was that guy is a world-class mm -hmm. pitcher. But by the same token, and I know you do this in your work, you need to teach the CEO how to tell a story. Right. So I'm, I back a company called Shadowbox. Uh, I was an early investor. I'm on the board. And I like the guy a lot. It's software. It's uh, electronic medical records. I won't bore you to tears. But about a week ago, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, he gives a pitch to a bunch of investors. Mm -hmm. And one of them takes the time to say the following. You got great technology. You tell the story in a terrible way. You don't tell a very good story. So this isn't in how he has actually got the goods. Right. He really knows what he's doing, but he doesn't tell it very well. So part of the, the duality of this little story about the Trump mm -hmm. pitcher who has no substance, but he's world-class. He's Richard Burton for right. socks. This guy is the real deal. And so one of the things you can do, and I spend time, is teaching people how to tell. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you how or what are some things that we could do to, to tell stories. So, you know, I love the fact that we sort of floated onto this topic because... Yeah. 
you know, as human beings, we think in stories, we feel in stories, we see in stories, we talk in stories. Stories are are to the core of who we are as beings, right? It's the same reason good marketing works, right? You know, gone are the days of remember selling features and benefits where it was like, oh, this is what the technology does or whatnot. It's like, well, well, paint the picture, paint the story. You know, it, it draws out the most, uh, most uh, innocent child in us, which is the imaginative child. So I know I've sort of prefaced this, but how important is it for leadership today to be a good storyteller? And part of that question, how important it is to have a real story? Well, that's a really good question. So the famous story, the first story is Steve Jobs. <clears throat> so Jobs had what was called sort of an alternate reality. Mm -hmm. He was a masterful storyteller. He could get people to believe that like Uri Geller, he could bend a spoon with, you know, his mm -hmm. mind. But by the same token, he also developed Apple and world-class technology. Okay. So, so that's kind of interesting but he was a cult figure. Cool. Now, by the same token, let's go to the woman who runs Theranos. Theranos is the company that raised a billion dollars and was a fraud run by <clears throat> a woman because she was going to do a, a testing with one drop. Oh, of yeah, blood. yeah, yeah. It's called Theranos, P-H-E-R-A-N-O-S, and it's Elizabeth, and I forget her last mm -hmm. name. She was a cult figure. She wore a black uh, turtleneck to all the events. She was so attractive. She had blonde hair. And she spun a tale of total fraud and mm -hmm. corruption. But she, had a, she was a believer. She told a great story. Let's do another one. So there's a guy named Adam Neumann. Adam Neumann runs a company called, ran a company called WeWork. WeWork was the company that raised a couple of billion dollars and was going to be in the real estate business, renting out, buying real estate, 20 floors and then renting it to startups. It piece by piece. Piece. He was a, a, you know, a guru, not a guru. He was a, a, a shaman. He was a magician. He, he had people believing he did crazy things. There's an article in the New York times recently about it. There's a book about it, but he was a storyteller. So now you come to something interesting. Does the storyteller have an obligation to tell the right. truth? How, you know, how, you know, how important it is in today's world. And you just hit it, right? Like, you know, we could, pr you could lead people through darkness. You could, you know, corruption, the, the whole sort of nine. But now that we know people are led by stories, how important is it for us to be um, truthful, have, an, have honesty? Uh, maybe even the bigger sort of, you know, with great powers comes great responsibility, which is if you can move people with story, where does, where does that fine line fall? When you tell a story... Now watch, you, you can tell the, this is the absolute truth as I know it mm -hmm. today. You can bend it a little. And then there's the part that says, <clears throat> I'm going to tell something. And I'm going to believe that by the time I need to deliver on it, I'll be there. So the famous line, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in, in Canada with Grant Wayne Gretzky is, I'm going to skate to where the puck is going to be not where it is right. today. So you've touched on a kind of an interesting area, which is now my personal nature is I have a, a tendency towards forward looking statements, mm -hmm. meaning I'm assuming that by sheer force of will, charisma or brains or luck, I can get to where I sort of thought that I'm going to tell them that I'm going to get to. Now, I'm also of the school of thought that if you don't get there, you got to give the money back. You can't run it into the ground. But part of what makes people believe that they can climb a mountain that they've never climbed is to tell them that they can climb that mountain, even though you haven't climbed that mountain yeah. either. So that's this quality of a combination of leadership, uh, uh, belief, mm -hmm. uh, imagination, but... The dark side, of course, is ego. Right. Uh, oh, her name is Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos, H-O-L-M-E-S. Yes. So the, the ego of uh, Neumann, the ego of Elizabeth Holmes, those are dangerous. Uh, those are, they, they really are mm -hmm. dangerous. And then in the case of somebody like Jobs or Jeff Bezos, their ego and their, and Elon Musk, I mean, Musk is a storyteller. Right. 
we're going to go and launch satellites. Nobody believes him. We're going to build a car that runs on electricity. But even if he's, but he delivered. I think stories are so important in the sense that I, for me as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure you'll appreciate this, and I, I connected with your statement of like, I just on some occasions have been successful out of pure will, grit, charisma, storytelling, uh, forward thinking, visionary, in some cases lying to myself in order for me to, 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 to get there. And we can argue that's things like mindset and sort of your inner dialogue. But at the end of the day, you know, telling stories of vision, where we're going, is one thing, right? But using stories to manipulate is a different. And I think, you know, that's where we started with this, which is in a lot of cases, it's hard to know the difference. And that's where they talked about the con man, right? Right, your best friend, the, 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 the greatest thing about a con man is you've never known you've been conned until it's too late. Right? Movies thinking stories. I mean, think about religion, spirituality, great leaders, thought leaders. It's all about stories. Anyway, I agree. Let's not go down the dark side of stories because as we said, you know, with the great powers comes great responsibility and we can we we can always use this. But you know, you did hit on something which is the importance of stories. And you know, let's go back to leadership, entrepreneurship, startups. Can a startup be successful if they don't have a good leader that can tell that story. The, the classic issue in the startup, in my opinion, and I've done, as I think, either founder or co-founder for eight, maybe eight or nine, I've always had a partner. So what I'm saying in the storytelling, you asked about story and leadership, and uh, I think my speech is you need a partner. Someone is the promoter and somebody is the technologist. <clears throat> and somebody is going to shape the vision and the market and the other person's gonna measure the data. And so without answering your question directly, the thing I would say is that I'm a big fan of partners. I don't think you can start something alone. I think. You can't have more than three, that's the rule. And two is pretty good. And the other rule is this, it can't be equal. Huh. So when you start, my, my son, by the way, is in a, is in a partnership okay. and they're gonna buy a business. I, I saw him on Sunday, gonna buy a business. I said, how are you planning to own this? He said, a third, a third, a third. I said, you know, that's wrong. He said, yes, I know it's wrong, but we've agreed that we'll, it will evolve. Yeah. That when we figure out the exact roles, we'll renegotiate. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. So there's a famous Harvard study that's been done and essentially says you can split the pie any way you want. It just can't be equal. Equal is wrong. Why, Why is it wrong? So First of all, I, I, I love this and I don't want to lose the question of, you know, what it takes to tell a good story about the components, but let's go here for a second. So uh, partnerships are difficult. I mean, more partnerships fail, more marriages fail right? If we can't get it right with people we're sleeping with, how the hell are we going to get it right with people that like we have to work with, right? Um, and in some cases, those worlds cross, you start sleeping with the people that you work with. And that's a whole nother problem, right? But why is it? <laughs> why is it not a good partnership to be equally split in money? And my I'll also preface this, my only partnership that I went into was with two other parties. And we did it that way, a third, a third, a third. And it just, it didn't work, even though they were defined roles. But walk me through that. Well, wait, wait, wait. You, you just told a story that it yeah. didn't work. So without asking you to be too okay. revealing, what I'll tell you is there is this, there, there, there's deep study on why it doesn't work. Okay. So let's, let, let's, let's go back for a minute and pretend, let's go back to the marriage. It's, it is a marriage, but it's not exactly a partnership. Now, I got to think about this. I, um, you know, I have to think well, about this. Your, so, there are defined, so, so why is it bad for your son to be in this exact equal split? Because he will do most of the work. Okay. And they need him more than he needs okay. them. He says to me, but they're more experienced. They're bringing a little bit more money. I said, okay. The, 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 the conflicts occur when we're in this together and when we, we're, we're up going up the mountain and 
my pack is 40 pounds and yours yep, is 20. All right, for a there. while. And it goes a little further. And then there's resentment. There's resentment. Let's, I want to renegotiate. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to renegotiate. I like this. Is resentment. I, you know, partnerships, statistically, you're correct. They're very hard. Mm-hmm. The, the interesting word is partner. Now, the, part, the word, I'm sort of thinking about this. The word partner is like fraught with power and meaning and we're in this together and we're partners versus we're going to start a business. We own it 62, 48, and I'm the CEO and you're the something, but whatever it is, I, I'm running it. You're not, we're, we're doing it together, but we're not partners. The word partner is a fascinating word because it implies equal. And then the dark sentence is it also implies that you're going to think the way I think that we're coming to a decision. And it's obvious to me we should turn mm-hmm. right. And my partner, partner says, no, 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 we should turn up. No, wait, wait, we've been, you're telling me after the, you don't, it's so obvious to turn right. And that's the, that's the sort of trick in the word. Yeah, yeah. it a, creates a false, call it expectation. My father said this to me a long time ago. I used to run a tech business and uh, had a couple guys that wanted to buy in and be partners. I said to this guy, why do you want to be a partner? And he's like, well, partner, I could do what I want. You know, I, I could contribute to the business. I can build the business. I could play golf on Fridays or Wednesdays if I feel like it. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, you do realize that if you take this on, you take on all the down as much as you take on the up. And at the time, my father said to me, never get into a partnership, right? Do a profit share, do revenue split, run open book management, do anything you can to make sure that you split that pie or share the pie if the intention is to contribute and to give back to people's efforts and to reward and help them. And as you grow, they grow. Awesome. But partnerships will, will, will always bring conflict. And it's kind of what you're saying here. Yeah, I think I'm having, I'm, I'm, I'm of two minds. I think you should always have somebody else as your partner when you start something, but I don't want a partnership. Right it's interesting. The word partnership is, is a, uh, is actually a, in, in America, a corporate concept, which is an LLC. So a limited liability company has partners. It has members who are partners, mm-hmm. whereas corporations have ownership and officers. Mm-hmm. So, but it's a nuanced area. Mm-hmm. It's part of trying to build things together. Right. When you think about, but when you think about huge successful companies, by and large, the, the, it is driven by a single person. Yeah, so hold on, hold on. So go there example, for a second. Say that again. Yeah. So you just said, so if you look at the majority of successful companies, right? we've just been talking about partnerships. Let's, let's pick an easy one. Let's pick Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft. So there was Bill Gates, Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Ballmer came later. Bill Gates and Paul Allen. But Bill Gates ran it. Paul Allen was the brains. He wrote the code. And, and however they split the money, Alan, of course, made billions as well. But that company was run by Bill Gates. His partner, mm-hmm. his, his, his partner who helped build that corporation was Paul Allen. And Ballmer, who's probably the most important in Microsoft, came. He was like employee number 18. Mm-hmm. So, so I, that word partner is really, that's the sentence, let's go do this together. The assumption in the word partner, I didn't think we'd get on this. I had some other things to talk about, but the assumption is that we will share a common vision and, and we do for a while. And then we come to that point in the road where what you tell, you're voting for Trump. Are you, I, I, I mean, not, don't, it's not possible. No, no, we, you, you can't, you're voting for Trump. No, I, I can't, I can't work right. with you. I mean, I have to tell you, I have some children I have some awareness of relationships in which the husband is a hardcore right wing, slightly right of Genghis Khan. (laughs) And the wife is, you know, kind of a more of a Bernie Sanders. And sounds like my house. I I don't know how it works. I I, hear some thoughts to that. So number one, there's that famous old saying that, you know, opposites attract. Now, why do opposites attract? Because as human beings, and I, I actually learned this from my ex-partner that didn't work out, so, you know, R&D it. Uh, but 
it says, you know, when we're born, we're born a complete circle. And as we grow up, we are broken in half. We're broken in half because we decide which way we're going to go in our personality. I'm kind of butchering the concept, but it basically says that we get to a stage in our formative years that we now pick a path. Am I going to be this way or am I going to be this way? Am I going to be like parent one? Am I going to be like parent two? I'm going to be a little bit. And we go with our individuality. And now we grow up. And later on in life, as we're running around these half circles, because as human beings, we're half circles, we meet someone else. Now the other half of that circle. Now that other half of the circle is a little different, you know, smells a little different, looks a little different, walks a little different, acts a little different, but it, it fulfills, it, it brings the other half that I've been missing. And at first it's romantic and it's why you stare at each other. You're still married, right? Yeah. Very remember much. those early days, right? Maybe you're all back into romantic love again, but. You know, even at this age, we, we, we have a romance once every three or four years. It's good. We're very happy. <laughs> so <laughs> on that note, but it's the exact thing that you're attracted to, that you're feeling fulfilled with that creates the conflict. So back to the partnership, right? So partnership. So hold on. So that's so one of the examples I give in this, how to start a business is you know, exactly what you said, which is, if my skills are marketing and this and this, but I need a technologist or I'm a scientist and I've got, you know, genomic whatever, but I need a, somebody that can tell the story. So that's pretty great. That's how it, that's how it gets right. done. That is how you fill the gaps. You, you don't hire three guys that all play shortstop. You need a pitcher and a first baseman. I mean, but then the question is, what is the skill set? And that's, I guess, where you and I have similarities, which is coaching, which is at some point you begin to kind of, you know, he's annoying the shit out right. of me. And that goes back to the very beginning, which is understanding neurotic impulses, understanding negotiation, understanding accommodation, understanding listening to the other person, all that other mm -hmm. stuff is what keeps partnerships together uh, together yeah. and successful yeah. no i was gonna Go say ahead. on that note it's uh it's the issue is rarely the other person it's usually self well that's the famous seinfeld joke where the, you know george says it's not you it's me and she says no 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 that's right. my line it's not me it's it's not you it's me it's the it's it's the not you it's me line but i i spend a lot of time uh, studying uh, what I'll call behavioral economics. I'm a big fan of Dan Kahneman and uh, Ariely and uh, all of the people who write about this stuff, Freakonomics. Mm -hmm. we, we undermine, we, we, we sort of sometimes are our own worst enemy. Kahneman wrote a book recently, uh, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Yep. And he gets to the very end of this book. I've Great suggested book. it a few times. And uh, the last five pages or four pages or essentially say this. They say, look, I'm Dan Kahneman. I won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002. I am the admitted guru. I am, I teach, I am the expert at rational man behavior. And then the last couple of paragraphs, he says, you know, in my own personal life, I get it wrong 20% mm -hmm. of the time. I mean, if the best in the business, he still gets it wrong. So it is hard to make rational decisions it's just hard. Right, because we're built on emotion. And we feel before we think, you know, as much as in, it doesn't matter how robotic and intelligent and analytical and cerebral as you are as a human being, you will always in some cases be driven by that emotion. This is where it all goes wrong. This is why we fight over politics, you know, left versus right, red versus blue. This is why I say Apple computers are better than, you know, IBMs. And we begin back to the story. I'm really good at seeing it in someone else. Yes. I mean, I, I'm a business psychoanalyst, okay? I, I'm really good at, I can listen and I can point out, you're gonna tell me the story and I'm gonna point out X. The trick is seeing it in mm -hmm. yourself. So one of the roles of coaching is, uh, 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 you know, do, do, do what I say, not what I do. But when you, when you act in your own behavior, it's much more difficult than Without any emotion, I can understand, well, Greg, here's what you told me. And so what you need to do is turn left. And, and you'll acknowledge it. You'll even thank me. You'll say, you know, you're right. I should have turned left. But in my own life, the GPS doesn't work. I go in a circle. I turn the car off. I get confused. I made right. my point. You did. 
you did. Anyway, I want to come back to storytelling. What, what do we need to do to tell good stories? I mean, if you were to coach someone on their narrative, on their story, uh, back to the, the thing you were telling us before, which is this individual is a hor- horrible storyteller. Great technology, horrible storyteller. Right. He's in front of the board and the board, the board is falling asleep. The board's going, oh, gosh, this is I, I've seen so many pie charts in my day. I got to listen to this asshole right now. So what does he need to do to win the hearts and the minds of these people when it comes down to storytelling? A story has an arc. And uh, so I'll give you a sort of finished. I don't know how long you want to talk, but I'll tell you one more story. And this is why we're still happily married. So this is the 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 how do you tell a good story? So I get I meet a woman. In October of 1993, her name is Barbara Bree. And in seven days, I think she's gonna be the mayor of San Diego. But we fall in love and she's a big shot at what's called Connect. Connect is an incubator in San Diego run by UCSD, University of California, San Mm -hmm. Diego. And it is a early stage incubator for tech and biotech companies. And she's the number two person. And in December, they have an event called the Most Innovative Products event, where they a companies audition and then they pick winners. <clears throat> and she's the keynote. She's gonna give the opening speech. So she comes to me and says, can you write me some stuff? I need, to, I need something to start with. Remember, I spent 10 years writing sitcoms and TV shows and Hollywood and crap. So, I'm, I'm, I, so I write three really good, fake, innovative products. Okay, <clears throat> and I give it to her and she says, this is great. And she practices to read it and she's terrible. Huh? huh? I mean, you have no, you don't know when to pause. So you need, first of all, she is Jewish, but you know, she doesn't talk yet quite like the cat seals. <laughs> so I work with her. And finally there's, she can get the, there's a pause. You wait for the laugh. I mean, I know when the laugh is coming, Barbara, just wait for it. Okay. All right, comes the day. She stands up, there's 550 people in this room, just like when I was a writer in Hollywood, I'm not invited. I sit in the back and I walk back and forth and I worry because that's what writers do. And she's really good. She had practiced and she nails it. And they, the audience applauds and they laugh and she owns them. The thing ends, a couple, three hours, whatever. It ends and she comes down off the stage and the, the, the newspaper come up to her. I get to come up and give her a hug. And the newspaper guy is standing there and he says, that opening was fantastic. Did you write that? She doesn't take a single pause. She says, yes. <laughs> Good for her. How could you not Good marry? How could you not right. marry that That's woman? amazing. And she's about to be the mayor of San Diego. So uh, but- she had no problem taking credit. And he thought her delivery, right. you know, after you work with her and She's much better now. She's really oh, good at it. You, but, she, uh, she, she, that's she, it. So that's the teaching. She might hard. have you to thank for her political success because you know. I don't. I. I don't think so. But but you 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 made a good session out of this one on storytelling. It's uh, it's it's really. It's yeah, and I'll tell you, it, if you're a kid, so it makes me think of this. Remember when you were a kid and you sat in the library and the uh, and the 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 teacher read yes, a story in a circle stories really move mm-hmm. people yeah and i think we take it for granted and i think you know people in some cases make storytelling this tactic and you know i, I like what we started with this which is i think if you're going to be a really i'll just paraphrase this i think if you're going to be a really great storyteller it comes from the place of genuinely wanting to move people in the right way and if you can start there and you could embellish a little and you could, you know, add some color and you can, you know, splash it up. Awesome. But it's always an effort of moving forward and never as a tactic. Yeah, I, I applaud what you said. It's the authenticity of really caring versus in the case of the Trump University, simply. Absolutely. Manipulate. Right. Because manipulation is easy. Scams are scams. Cons are cons. Like, you know, I think this world needs more authenticity. It's, you know, I was talking with someone earlier. The word authenticity has been, it's for me, is starting to be butchered. Why? Because every corporate asshole right now is running around screaming authentic leadership. 
It's really important that we have authentic leadership. It's really important that we, we actually live who we say we're going to be in work because this is what the young little in millennials and employees need. And so, and I want to scream at these people to go, for fuck's sake, man, like you should be just an authentic human being genuinely. You know, look, I'm a p- pretty polarizing personality. And I'm very aware of it. (laughs) And I I try to, to, I'm very conscious of sort of my audience and stuff. But one of the things that I've always stood very proud of or or been is one of the principles is I'm probably the most raw, authentic person. What you see is what you get, right? Um, And it's jeopardized me in some capacity. It's, it's, It's caused business challenges in some issue. It's created friendship issues in some capacity. But, you know, our friend... Wait, 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 not so fast. I'm going to also argue it brought you. But it did. It did. It wasn't all bad. And like, you know, it's it's you got to go through the you got to be willing to deal with some of the fallout in order to to reap some of the reward. And, you know, our good friend, Peter, who was the guy that actually introduced us. um, I'll never forget what he said. He said, at the end of the day, people that have opinions are attractive. Right. Whether you agree with the opinion, disagree with the opinion, whether you like the person or don't like the person, you'll definitely respect the person for having an opinion, right? And that quote sat with me for a while. So, Neil, let's switch gears a little bit. I know you got some stuff on your list. You got, you got, you got some knowledge to drop. You got some wisdom to share. I'm going to tell you a story about prison. Yeah, yes. so thank I'm, God, I'm, thank uh, you for going there because I do want to talk about this. My, my next project is... Uh, a mobile app to see if I can change prison recidivism. So instead of telling you about the app and blah, 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 I'll tell you how I met my co-founder. Now that's an interesting, there's a different word here. It's not partner, mm-hmm. the word's co-founder. Mm-hmm. So- and, and I'm assuming the partnership on a financial, however it's been brokered, is not equal. No, it is not equal by okay. any stretch. So, but I wrote a book called I'm There For You, Baby, The Entrepreneur's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. And there's 220 rules in it. And rule number three is probably one of the most important. Rule three says you need to go to all the meetings and all the events, in particular, the ones that you are sure are a total waste of time. So here's the story. I, I, it's a longer story, but I'm only interested in the single piece. I spend some time in prison in the summer of 2000. 17, 16, 2016, mm-hmm. 16. Uh, teaching, uh, listening, and learning about entrepreneurship. By the way, I just have to pause you for a second. That you are an excellent storyteller because you just said, I spent some time in prison, you know, 2016. Big pause, audience went, <gasps> and then you dropped the bomb. Teaching and delivering, and da 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 da. My, my wife would have hoped I'd stayed overnight. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, so go on. So you're working in the prison, teaching and coaching. and mentoring. So that's July. The longer story, and maybe I'll tell that another time we talk. But comes July, and, and then it gets to September. September, October of 2016, my wife is running for the city council. That's the 2016 race. And she's at an event. And at this event, she meets a guy whose name is Dr. Alan Mobley. And she says, yeah, da, da, da. And he says, I teach at San Diego State University. I have a PhD. I'm in charge of their criminology division department and, and uh, reentry. She says, you know, you ought to talk to my husband. He, uh, he spent some time. He's interested in this. So she says, you need to call this guy. Now, here's the first rule. I know it's a total waste of time. There's nothing going to come of it. But I'm always good for 20 bucks and a cheap sushi mm. lunch. So I say, OK. He comes. I can see the restaurant from my office where we sat. And he sits down. <clears throat> I, we order. And he starts to eat. And he says, tells the story. He says uh, he was uh, 19. Uh, Orange County was in college. I think University uh, UC Irvine, University of California at Irvine. And uh, he meets a girl. All good stories start with he meets Mm -hmm. a girl and he goes to meet this girl's family. This girl lives in Colombia, like Colombia, like South America, Colombia, not Colombia, Maryland. And turns out this woman's family is the Medellin. They are the cartel in Colombia. And he, 
from 1980 to 1984 becomes the largest cocaine dealer in the country. Now, this is an important distinction. I'm going to tell you about this guy because one time I'm introducing him and I say, you know, he was the largest cocaine dealer um, in, uh, or what? I, I said, one of the largest cocaine dealers in the country. He says, no, no, I wasn't one of, I was the. And what's his name? Anyway, by the way. it's the Reagan, Reagan era. He gets tossed, he gets a 45 year sentence. They're going to lock him up forever. Uh, over that course of 10 years, he, uh, he gets his, finishes colleges, gets a master, uh, uh, pleads with a judge, gets out, gets a PhD, and becomes the really the driving force in California for prison recidivism and prison mm -hmm. reform. Because now watch, I said he's a co-founder because while I'm a well-meaning character, he's the real deal. So you need domain expertise. You, you, you know, I'm kind of a white middle-class Jewish. It's nice. You want to change the world, but you don't know shit about right. prison. So for the past three years, he and I have been teaching at Donovan State Prison. So I, I, I've got some cred. Here's the best part of the story. You never know where a good idea is going to come from. We're teaching and we have a class of 15 of my, I call my favorite felons. And it's a seven week class. And on week four, I'm walking to, towards the end of the day. And I say, hey, listen, shit heals. When you get out, is there a one-stop shopping? Is there a marketplace where you can get all the stuff you need other than, you know, where's the closest in and out burger? They say, no, there's no such organized uh, facility like a two-sided marketplace. Right. That's not possible. They say, huh. So Dr. Mobley and I, we go do some homework, come back, and we say, you know what? You're right. There isn't. And so over the past year, we've developed essentially – a marketplace of NGOs and customers. And we got to deal with Apple and we're moving the ball. But what makes it legitimate is that while I know a lot about business and tech and finance and marketing and crap like that, unless I had my co-founder who had really done time, who knew who the customer really was, it would be an exercise in futility. Right. So I guess I'd end with, it isn't so much a partner as it is a co-founder with certain kinds of domain expertise that you, the founder, might not have. Let me ask, let me ask you another question. When In all of your partnerships, have you been the majority owner? Yeah, that's interesting. Although I built a lot of real estate. Mm -hmm. Before I was tech, I built two million, almost two million square feet of mm -hmm. real estate. A couple of hotels, two offices, a parking garage, apartments. And in real estate development, you're not the majority owner. The guy who put up the, the money yeah. is the majority owner. You might be the managing partner. <clears throat> you know, it's funny. I'm not sure that ownership is the same as leadership. Definitely not. It, it, you can be, you, you, know, you don't have to own 50. This this 51% is insanity. You don't need to own 51%. If, if you can't lead by persuasion of the quality of the idea, so unless, unless it is compelling and you can, you lead people not by owning more of it, but by having a shared view of where and you're shared going. shared values. I agree. Very cool. All right. We are going to have to do a part two because uh, I think we've just started to scratch the surface, but this was awesome today, man. Neil, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your thoughts, your wisdom, your stories. Your stories are the best. I do want to uh, ask you one final question. So what stage is the app at? Because last we left off, you said something very colorful, which is you're, a, you're about to go have a meeting. And if it goes well, amazing. And if not, fuck it, you're going to do it yourself. I'm not sure that I can do this it may be more complicated, but what I did, here's the way to say it. The most dangerous person in the room is the person who has nothing to lose. So there's a company that I, I want something from this company. And I had been politely dancing. So the other day we have another call. And essentially what I say is if you don't, do this. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go a different direction. It's a little bit of the drawing a line in the mm -hmm. sand. And my advice when I coach is this. You got to know when to draw a line in the sand. You got to know where, how close to the ocean mm -hmm. to put it. 
because maybe it has to get washed away. But there is, in the, especially in the tech racket, there's this thing called FOMO, F-O-M-O, which is fear of yep. missing out. Most younger generation and have that. When you, when you, if you keep dancing, as long as we can dance, I don't have to make a decision, we'll dance. And, and finally you say, look, pal, listen, motherfucker, you either yay or nay. And then you're stuck with, well, uh, so I, I have friends of mine, for example, I have a friend of mine, ironically, who had the chance, he said he had a chance to do X or he could have been employee number nine at Facebook. He picked X. He sort of kicks himself in life. Who knows? You don't know. You don't know. But man, the FOMO pr rule, which is, I don't want to miss it. You get a lot of yeses from that. We'll see what the guy says. I mean, uh, you know, and that's part of the story, which is, I told him that I have all of this. I, I don't exactly have all. I got some. Well, I have. Well, I didn't. Ex I don't know exactly. There's some of it. But as far as you're concerned, I have all of this. So it's a little bit of a. Eh, it's a, it's it's a Hail Mary. It's, it's, and, you know, that's what entrepreneurship is about. It's about the risk. It's about the story. It's about the vision. It's about going for it. It's about getting people to join you in your journey. And it's it's tough, you know. And again, hopefully we're doing this authentically and genu genuinely. Yeah, I believe in that. I sort of, I think the way I'd say it, my view is I put a gun to his head, but I'm not sure there's bullets in it. <laughs> that's good. Maybe a BB gun. Okay, okay. Neil, we're definitely, we're definitely going to have to do this again. Just tell the audience where they can find you if they want to get in touch with you. I'm Neil, N-E-I-L, at Blackbird V, B-L-A-C-K-B-I-R-D, and then the letter V like Victor, only the letter Neil at BlackbirdV.com. And you can, it's easy to find my last name. Go to Google and there's a whole bunch of formerly incarcerated pictures of me. <laughs> so. Amazing. Man, we're definitely going to have to follow this up again. And I'm just going to walk us out. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had an awesome time listening to us today. If you like the show, don't forget to like the, like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and don't forget to share. And Neil, we will get your information posted because uh, I think there's a lot of people that want to talk to you. Neil, thank you so much. We will talk to you soon. Thank you. You were wonderful. My pleasure. Good luck Cheers. to all. Hey, I'm Greg Witz. Thanks so much for coming and checking out the video. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. So I'd highly suggest that you click this video over here. And don't forget to subscribe and share.